The Friday the 13th franchise has an incredibly messy timeline that stretches across 11 films and nearly 500 canonical years. You did not hear that wrong. From the origin of Jason Voorhees himself through to the far-flung realms of space, God, this franchise is bonkers. This is the complete Friday the 13th timeline finally explained. Okay, we kick this mad journey off in 1979, the year in which the majority of the original Friday the 13th takes place. I say majority because the film actually starts in 1958, when a pair of camp counsellors are unceremoniously killed by an unseen murderer at Camp Crystal Lake. This double homicide reaffirms a curse said to be attached to the lake, one dating back to 1957, when a young boy drowned there after being neglected by horny teens working at the camp. Remember this as it's pretty much the most pivotal moment in this whole franchise. Fast forward 21 years and we're with a group of fresh-faced teens who are prepping the campground for its imminent opening. They're being supervised by the lecce owner Steve Christie, who leaves the campsite to grab supplies before an approaching thunderstorm hits. Our gang of teens do sweet f all while he's gone, they go swimming, kill a poor defenceless snake, and Kevin Bacon gets his game face on, only to get an arrow right through the neck. One by one, the camp counsellors are picked off by an unknown knife-wielding maniac, until we're left with our final girl, Alice, who blocks herself into one of the cabins. Enter one Pamela Voorhees. Well, I, I'm Mrs. Voorhees, an old friend of the Christie's. Who has supposedly come to offer some help. But there's something not quite right about Mrs. Voorhees, a point that's proven when she reveals herself to be the mother of Jason, the kid who died all those years ago. Jason was my son, and today is his birthday. Mama Voorhees immediately switches from concerned to murderous, and chases Alice all over the campsite. After a prolonged fight on the edge of the lake, Alice gets the best of Mrs. Voorhees, decapitating her with a machete, a death that is shot in glorious slow motion as if it's the winning goal in a World Cup final. Alice fumbles her way into a canoe and paddles out onto the lake where presumably she thinks she'll be safest. Either way, the police arrive the next morning and with Alice perfectly safe, the original Friday the 13th is brought to a close. Well, not quite. There's time for one last jump scare, which it turns out is all in Alice's head. With Alice safely in hospital, she inquires into whether the police ever found a boy in the lake. The one who attacked me, the one who pulled me underneath the water. Ma'am, we didn't find any boy. Ooh, spooky. The first sequel of Many kicks off with an extended opening that basically just recaps the previous film and kills off that film's final girl, Alice. <laughs> the actual main plot for Friday the 13th Part 2 is set five years later though, as we are constantly reminded. It was five years ago. Five years. Five years and that's the way we want to keep it. It's 1984 and we are back at Crystal Lake because nobody has learned anything from the events of the original film. A whole new cast of horny teens have respawned in the area and they've taken up residence on the shores of the Cursed Lake. After the urban legend of Jason Voorhees is regaled around a campfire, our gang make for the nearest bar for one last night out before their summer of work begins. All except for a select few who opt to stay behind. Absolutely zero guesses for what happens to them. <laughs> Eventually, the teens return from the pub only to find the lakeside camp in absolute carnage. And no surprises, it's Jason Voorhees behind the machete racking up those kill streaks. Turns out Jason didn't die all those years ago and has been roaming the Crystal Lake woods ever since. You might ask yourself questions like, where's he been all those years? And how did a child turn into a just giant man mountain while surviving off the woods? But the filmmakers would really rather you didn't. Jason got a taste for killing by murdering Alice back in the prologue, which in his sick, twisted head was revenge for Alice decapitating his mum. Anywho, Jason's 1984 carnage continues when he chases part two's final girl, a counsellor named Ginny, to his shack in the woods. There, Ginny discovers a shrine with Mrs. Voorhees' severed head on it, and has the absolutely bonkers idea of pretending to be Mrs. Voorhees by putting on her jumper and, well, damn, it actually nearly works. Now come to mommy. Jason is no fool though, well, not yet at least, and he sees through Jenny's ruse. 
Just as she's about to be killed, her boyfriend Paul bursts in to save the day and the pair overpower Jason with his own machete. Or did they? Well, I'm not actually sure because the ending to part two is genuinely quite ambiguous. Either way, we are treated to another glorious jump scare. This time a maskless Jason jumping through Ginny and Paul's cabin window, all before it's revealed to be a part of Ginny's dream. Paul? Where's Paul? The third instalment in the franchise takes place immediately after the events of part two. It's the day after Jason's night of destruction, and who's ready for another rerun of Teens Getting Murdered? I sure as hell am. This time, the whole film is in eye-popping 3D, because that was a thing in 1982 when the movie was released. I mean, there is so much unnecessary gimmicky 3D in this movie. Half the film is basically just people poking stuff into the camera. At least there's some inventive kills, I guess. All right, I'm getting quite cynical. Let's get back to the timeline. After escaping the police at the end of part two, a wounded Jason makes for a convenience store to get medical supplies, murdering the husband and wife team who run it in the process. While this is going on, a new gang of teens arrive in the area for a bit of summer sun. Most of them are absolutely forgettable, all except for practical joker Shelley, who is easily the best character in the franchise so far. It's top lad Shelley that we have to thank for giving us the iconic look of Jason Voorhees too. Shelley uses a hockey mask to scare one of his pals, and well, it's the last prank he ever pulls, as he is thoroughly murdered by Jason shortly after. The hockey mask lives on though, and here we are, precisely an hour into part three, and nearly four hours into the franchise overall, and Jason Voorhees has finally completed his iconic costume. To celebrate, he murders our forgettable teens until we're left with the customary final girl called Chris. Before we get ahead of ourselves, it's revealed earlier in the film that Chris actually has history with Jason. She was attacked by him two years previously in 1982 and has only now returned to Crystal Lake to get over her trauma. She does this in style by lodging a great hulking axe into Jason's skull. Exhausted, she drops into a canoe and gets out on the lake. Why is this becoming a trend in these movies? The trademark final jump scare predictably makes its entrance, only this time it's Mrs. Voorhees springing from the lake, complete with her head attached for some reason. Again, it's only a dream. As Chris is taken away, we see the body of Jason still lying with the axe lodged in his head. Ooh, I wonder if it will stay that way. The next Friday the 13th is known as the final chapter, which as we all know means the fourth of 11 films. This film was meant to put a nice neat little bow on the Friday the 13th franchise back in 1984. However, it did so well at the box office that, well, we got another seven films. And to be fair, this one's pretty good and features Corey Feldman and Marty McFly's dad to boot. Proceedings kick off pretty much immediately after Friday part three with Jason's corpse being carted off to the morgue. For reasons that aren't really explained, Jason is revived, and he makes haste in murdering the on-duty coroners. With Jason back, we enter pretty familiar territory. Horny teens, Crystal Lake, murder and mayhem, etc, etc. But this time around, there are a couple of new ingredients added into the mix. First up, we've got Corey Feldman's 12-year-old Tommy Jarvis, a monster makeup enthusiast and creepy peeping Tom? Is that right? Oh god. Tommy lives with his mum and sister Trish next door to the house full of horny teenagers. And then there's this lumberjack looking guy Rob Dyer who's seeking revenge on Jason for the murder of his sister Sandra, all the way back in part two. Wait, which one was she again? <laughs> oh yeah, I remember the human kebab. Anyway, Jason eventually turns up for a spot of murdering and he promptly dispatches pretty much the entire cast until it's just Tommy, Trish and Jason. After an extended chase sequence through both houses, Jason finally corners Trish, only to be distracted by... Jason! Uh, I think he's tried to make himself look like Jason as a kid. I think. Either way, this distracts Jason enough for Trish and Tommy to finish the machete-wielding madman off once and for all. Of course this franchise isn't done yet, and with part 5 a new beginning, this timeline is about to get all kinds of messy. 
Little bald Tommy Jarvis, who was 12 in the last film, is now nearing adulthood at the age of 17, placing this film approximately in 1989. It doesn't help matters that he's played by the then 25-year-old John Shepard. I guess the stress of his encounter with Jason aged him prematurely. In the wake of killing a horror icon in the previous film, a traumatised Tommy has been shuffled around from institute to institute, eventually arriving at the Pinehurst Halfway House. Predictably, things get stabby as soon as he arrives, starting with this poor lad, Joey, who gets axed by a wood-chopping teen just for being talkative. This kickstarts another slate of mysterious killings. I say mysterious because this film is notable for the absence of Jason Voorhees, who very much died in the last film. The a new beginning of the title was supposed to be a fresh start for the franchise, but as you'll see, this film's villain is just… crap. I'm getting ahead of myself. With no Jason, a new beginning kinda plays out like an R-rated version of Scooby-Doo, as bland, forgettable characters get murdered at an alarming rate by a mysterious killer wearing Jason's iconic hockey mask. This mysterious murder frenzy eventually culminates in the not-Jason squaring off against a final team of survivors, a counsellor called Pam, a kid called Reggie, and our mate Tommy Jarvis. The gang of meddlesome kids eventually overpower the not-Jason and unmask him to be none other than... Who? Wait, is that the paramedic from earlier in the film? Yeah, that's uh, Roy Burns, who is apparently Joey's father. Remember Joey, the motor mouth that got axed earlier? Anyway, seeing his son's mutilated corpse turned Roy insane, and he leveraged the legend of Jason Voorhees to get revenge. Come on, Roy. <laughs> get your hands dirty. I'm not gonna lie, that reveal was massively underwhelming. Luckily, the producers thought so too, and they made that fact abundantly clear with the next film's title. Yeah, Jason wasn't in the last movie, so they make sure Jason Lives is in the title of this one to correct the mistake. And you know what? This one's probably the best so far. The year is 1990, and we're back with 18-year-old Tommy Jarvis, this time played by 28-year-old Tom Matthews. So they didn't even try with that one, I guess. The film kicks off with Tommy and a pal attempting to burn the corpse of Jason, sending him to hell for good. Instead, they accidentally resurrect Jason, and with that, the Friday the 13th franchise wades into the supernatural for the very first time. To celebrate, an undead Jason punches Tommy's pal right through the chest, and we're all treated to a glorious Friday the 13th rendition of the classic James Bond Gumball. Yeah, what a start. We're back at Camp Crystal Lake, now renamed Forest Green. There's a gang of new horny teenage counsellors, and Jason gets to killing straight away. What makes Jason Lives unique, though, is a newfound sense of humour. The characters are all self-aware. I've seen enough horror movies to know any weirdo wearing a mask is never friendly. And the gruesome kills are laced with a healthy dose of absurd parody. The characters aren't complete douchebags as well, and that makes it easier to become invested in Tommy's plight to bring Jason's killing ways to an end. He eventually does this by leading him back to Camp Crystal Lake, where he wrestles with Jason before sending him to the bottom of the lake chained to a giant boulder. Is he finally dead? Not by a long shot. A last lingering look at the soggy murderer shows he's just biding his time, waiting for... The New Blood, a fresh stab at a clean slate for the franchise, offered up another vague time jump for this increasingly confusing timeline. Proceedings kick off quite soon after the events of Jason Lives, with an opening scene taking place on the 13th of October on Crystal Lake. We then see our undead pal still chained to the bottom of the lake before meeting the Shepherd family and their 10-year-old daughter Tina. Upset at her alcoholic father for abusing her mother, Tina runs away and ends up on the lake, where she accidentally kills her father with telekinetic powers. We are really through the looking glass here, folks. Yeah, this film was originally planned to be Freddy vs. Jason, a crossover with the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, but the rights couldn't be secured and so that idea went on the back burner for another 15 years. Instead, the idea of Jason vs. Carrie was mooted, and as a result, we got this half-baked mess. Anyway, back to the timeline. We fast forward in time and we're back with Tina, who's now a 17-year-old dealing with her telekinetic powers and the fact that she pretty much murdered her father. 
With that time jump, I placed the new blood in the late 90s, most likely around 1997. And with that bombshell, please enjoy all the amazing 80s haircuts, living life proudly just three years short of the millennium. This is a Friday the 13th movie though, and we need some horny teens to kill. Enter this bunch, who are waiting to surprise a friend for their birthday at Crystal Lake, which doesn't seem to go by Forest Green anymore. I guess they just embrace their murderous urban legend. Long story short, everyone dies, and in particularly bloodless fashion as well, as the MPAA went to town censoring this movie. We're finally left with Carrie, I mean Tina, a top lad named Nick, and of course the undead Jason who's now sporting a gruesome rotting ribcage. We get the telekinetic battle we're promised, and it's not half bad to be fair. Carrie slash Tina whips Jason's mask off, strangles him with some electric cabling, and then sets him and the whole house on fire. Is that enough to kill Jason? Hell no. This is a horror movie, of course, and Jason makes one... I'm going to sneeze. Oh, I'm going to sneeze. I'm not going to sneeze. Jason makes one last play before being dragged to the depths of Crystal Lake by the reincarnated telekinetic ghost of Tina's dad? <laughs> Right, we are eight films into this franchise and things are going from bad to worse for this timeline. Jason Takes Manhattan is set roughly a year after the New Blood, a date I've gleaned from the fact that Jason wakes up following the events of the previous film to stalk a load of teens graduating, an event that would likely happen at the end of the next school year, hence 1998. And for a film set in the late 90s, it sure as hell looks a lot like it was filmed and released in 1989. Like The New Blood, there is a liberal dose of 80s pop culture, there's not a Nokia 5110 anywhere in sight, and wait, was that the logo for Tim Burton's Batman in Times Square? A film that famously came out in 1989. Sure was. Okay, plot-wise, part 8 sees Jason resurrected again to murder a pair of teens on a boat and somehow sails said boat all the way from Crystal Lake to the sea. There he boards a booze cruise for students celebrating their graduation. As the ship heads across stormy seas towards the titular Manhattan, Jason makes the most of the journey, stabbing and bludgeoning each student at every turn. Revolutionary stuff, I'm sure you'll agree. It also becomes apparent that Jason can now teleport at will, but this appears to be more of an excuse for lazy filmmaking than it is a point of character development. Jason eventually arrives at Manhattan and chases our remaining survivors, not gonna lie, I've already forgotten their names, into the streets of New York City. En route, he kills a couple of muggers, blows up a police car, and most impressively, punches a guy's head clean off. Our final pair of teens are chased down into the sewers by Jason, and just as he catches up with them, a ton of toxic waste washes through, supposedly killing him. He briefly turns into a vision of himself as an innocent child, as this film, like about eight other entries in this franchise, was supposed to be the last Friday the 13th film and bring it all to a satisfying close. It didn't, and it wasn't. As has become the tradition with the naming conventions of this mad franchise, Jason Goes to Hell The Final Friday is not The Final Friday. The year is 2003, and welcome to the film in the Friday the 13th franchise that totally loses the plot. Since his reign of carnage across Manhattan, Jason Voorhees has reached the top of the FBI's most wanted list. Yeah, the FBI are hunting down supernatural criminals now. They succeed in doing this in the opening scene of the movie, and Jason's obliterated corpse is taken to the morgue. While there, Jason's soul possesses the coroner, who, well, then... He eats Jason's heart and becomes Jason. Either way, Jason is back and he goes on another killing spree. It's just less interesting this time because he doesn't look like Jason. There's also a ton of retcon supernatural rubbish that this film just conveniently adds into the canon. Firstly, it turns out that the only way Jason can truly be killed is by another member of the Voorhees family. Secondly, and in no way contrived for the purposes of this movie, it turns out that Jason actually has a half-sister, Diana, and if he possesses her, or any of her descendants, he'll return to his normal, invincible state. Armed with all that nonsense, the film then charges full speed ahead with the soul of Jason jumping from one host to the next until he finally returns to his iconic self having possessed his half-sister, about an hour and 20 minutes into an hour and 25 minute film. Yeah, there is approximately 5 minutes of Jason Voorhees in this movie. 
Instead, we get this disgusting slug monster thing. This car crash ends with Jason being stabbed by his half-niece, is that a thing? Using some magical dagger that's not really explained, and he is dragged to hell once and for all. And as we know, this is the final Friday, so that's very much the end of Jason Voorhees. Oh, for f sake. Finally, it's the Freddy vs. Jason crossover surprisingly few of us have been waiting 15 years for. Jason is summoned back from hell by a Nightmare on Elm Street's Freddy Krueger, just a short while after the events of the final Friday. We can place this film in 2003 due to a billboard sign advertising the reopening of Crystal Lake in spring 2004. Freddy has brought Jason back from the dead to aid him in his never-ending quest to murder the teens of Springwood. You see, our Fred has lost his touch, and he needs Jason's help to cultivate a little fear among the population. But what Freddy doesn't count for is Jason stealing his kills, and this is basically the entire reasoning behind the titular fight. Of course, there's some bland, forgettable teens to be slaughtered along the way, but really, we're all here for the big fight. Three rounds between two icons of horror with only one winner. Who's ready? For about 15 minutes of actual Freddy vs Jason in a 90 minute movie. There's stabbing and slashing galore across those precious 15 minutes, but this battle between two immortal demons rapidly reaches its climax at the shores of Crystal Lake, when Jason impales Freddy with his own arm. Freddy is then decapitated by one of the forgettable teens, and both Freddy and Jason sink into the depths of Crystal Lake, both very dead. Only our pal Jason didn't die. He emerges from the water the next day carrying the severed head of Freddy, which cheekily winks at the camera. <sighs> sure. We've reached the final leg on this hellish journey, Jason X, and we can file this one under the so bad it's good category. Of course Jason was eventually heading to space, there was surely no other logical way to conclude this mad franchise, and Jason X does not disappoint. The film kicks off in 2010 with an incarcerated Jason in a maximum security prison at the Crystal Lake Research Facility. He escapes because otherwise there wouldn't be a movie, and ends up getting cryogenically frozen by one of his captors. Fast forward around 450 years, and we're in the year 2455. A space field trip leads a group of space students and a space professor to uncover the frozen remains of Jason and his captor, and they are promptly transported back to their spaceship orbiting the devastated remains of Earth-1. Obviously, Jason awakes from his slumber and gets to killing. The editing here appears to suggest that Jason wakes up on the spaceship just as the teens start having sex. Is this how deep his hatred of premarital teen sex goes? I'm gonna say yes. Either way, he tears his way through the ship, starting with the horny teens and upgrading to a squad of space commandos until he meets his match in a creepy android called KM-14, who absolutely obliterates him. But this being the future, Jason is revived by some nanotechnology that restores him, and then some. This new Uber Jason causes even more carnage before he's blown out of the goddamn spaceship and down to Earth 2, the final Earth A, where he lands conveniently in a lake with some nearby teens making out. And with that, the franchise has come full circle. Ah, oh, it's beautiful, it's like poetry. And that is the Friday the 13th timeline fully explained. As you may have noticed, I've not included the 2009 reboot here, as that film actually takes place in an alternate universe, and thus doesn't really fit into the canonical timeline here. I hope you enjoyed this chronological breakdown of this mad franchise. I've had a ton of fun going down the rabbit hole and trying to piece it all together. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below, and I'll catch you next time.